It's the Mustang Insider Show. Come one, come all. This is the Mustang Insider Podcast. I'm Chris Sylvester. We are talking all things Cal Poly Athletics. About to be joined by head men's basketball coach John Smith. The hoop season right around the corner. Exhibition on Thursday. And then the real thing gets going on Monday of next week. But before we get started, as always, we'd like to remind you that this podcast made possible by our friends at French Hospital Medical Center, award-winning, high-quality, safe medical care that you can trust. It's just around the corner at French Hospital Medical Center. Proud supporters of Cal Poly Athletics. Learn more at dignityhealth.org forward slash French Hospital. All right, John Smith is with us here on Mustang Insider. Coach, appreciate you taking some time out of your busy schedule. And, And it does get busier this time of year as we get ready to flip the calendar to November. I, I see your off-season facial hair, the goatee is gone, and, and that has to be a signal that basketball season is near. Definitely, most definitely. It's, it's go time, as we say, you know. And, uh, yeah, we're just uh, eagerly uh, and anxious to get going on, on Thursday. You know, I'm, I can't wait to get into the film session and get to practice today because these guys uh, – these guys are ready to uh, show what they can do, but uh, there's still so much more that they can learn every single day. Now, hey, take me through the off season, man, because, you know, we were sitting here this time last year and, and you know, you were bringing back more than 80% of your scoring. And look, I mean, if, if you were to hit pause on last season at the end of the calendar year, you guys had seven wins. You guys had six out of conference wins. You won your big West opener. And then, you know, you had a lot of close games in conference that just didn't go your way and you were you guys were kind of able to hit the reset button once you got to the big west tournament i mean you beat, you beat the brakes off of long beach you had a halftime lead over santa barbara who wound up winning the whole thing and, and giving baylor a really good game in march madness but but I, I i know that last season fell short of your expectation and and obviously if you would have kept up at that pace that you were on prior to the month of january i mean you probably win 15 games when was the last time cal poly's won 15 games in, in in a men's basketball season I mean it, it you'd have to go back over a decade I mean it's it's been a long time and it, it it hasn't been um any easy task trying to build this program into a big west powerhouse but you turn the page to this season and uh th- there aren't a ton of returners on this team there's a lot of newcomers you're expecting transfers and, and freshmen to make an impact um t- take me through the off season and 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 kind of just your philosophy on on this program and how maybe last year kind of changed your vision a little bit. It definitely changed my vision. You know, I, I, I brought in guys that I, you know, you met me my first day on campus, my first week on campus, you interviewed me and I talked about trying to, trying to change the culture. Right. And, you know, at the end of last year, you know, I felt the culture was, was not where it needed to be. And so our, our staff, we got together and, and we talked about recalibrating the culture and, and bringing in guys that, that, are that want to be at Cal Poly, that love to be at Cal Poly, that love to compete and, and have high motor. Because as you said, like we were in a lot of games and that that's a testament to our staff and the preparation that we have. Now it's just about having guys that that have the motor and the and the, and the will and the want to, uh, to fight through certain things and, and continue to build this program. So we brought in a ton of guys with, with some great experience. Um, you know, Jared Hyder off the top of my head, you know, the, uh, a, a grad transfer from Cal Berkeley who has a great deal of experience of 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 what what I just explained in terms of playing hard and competing and playing with a high motor and then our JUCO guys um, they they bring a, a wealth of energy from from day one um, Joel Armour Trading and, and Cam Mowry um, just to to name two of them but you know that's the main focus for us was trying to recalibrate the culture with guys that 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 are going to consistently play hard for four to five to six months at a time, um, however long it takes for us to get to our, our final goal. You mentioned uh, Jared Hyder off the jump, and and that's kind of where I want to start when, when talking about these newcomers, because uh, I remember this guy, uh, I think your first year here, uh, yeah. he, we, we played Fresno State in mod, and um, he, he was one of the best freshmen on the West Coast at that time, averaged you know, more than nine points a game. And uh, wound up transferring to Cal and, and things didn't really work out at Cal. He battled through some injuries there. I mean, this is a guy that that hasn't played a ton of basketball in right. the last couple of years. And I know you're kind of slowly but surely easing him in as we get ready for the start of the season. And uh, I mean, what type of, you know, minutes restriction do you, 
if any, might you have him on here at, at the jump? And I remember when he, he visited early in the offseason, you, you said that you guys kind of hit it off and you guys kind of clicked because there's a there's a collective kind of chip on your shoulder because you, you feel like you you have more to prove this season as the head coach. And, and he feels like he has a lot more to prove as a college basketball player since that, that tenure at Cal didn't really go how he wanted it to. Without a doubt, you know, both of us come from the Inland Empire. Um, he's from San Bernardino area, and I started my coaching career in San Bernardino. And and it's a it's a, a it's a toughness about you coming from that that area, and and he has that. And yeah, we're both playing with a chip on our shoulders because he was brought to Cal to be you know starting point guard. Things didn't work out for him, and people have written him off. You know, I was brought here to try and you know upstart this program, and it hasn't gone that way. And people have written us off, so we kind of have that same mindset. And as far as the minutes restriction, um, yeah, we definitely – we have the luxury of having Kobe Sanders, as you know, who who's played every position and is a very, very, very solid point guard, right? Um, so we're able to move Kobe over um, from time to time and, and give Jared more time off the floor um, and let his body, you know, recover because he's gone through a lot, you know, back surgery, ankle surgery, and, and hadn't played in two years. So – yeah, he will definitely be on a, a minutes restriction. I don't have a number for you, but it will definitely be. You'll see him being taken out before media timeouts a lot um, and get some rest um, and then come back after a media timeout. And so that's how we'll kind of play it. Talk about some of those other Juco guys you brought in. Uh, and, and you and I, we met up in, in Hutchinson last year and, and got to see that national tournament. So so many great players there. And I, I think people would be surprised how much junior college players still get recruited in this day and age of the transfer portal. You know, we've seen all of these waivers now of two-time transfers get denied. And I know you guys barely got over the hump with Jared Hyder here just, just a few weeks ago. So I think a lot of, of players these days are realizing that, Hey, you know, I'm not going to have much luck battling the NCAA transferring twice before, you know, being a grad transfer. Why don't I go bet on myself for a year at a Juco and, and see what I can get. And so, you know, a guy like Joel Arma trading who, who you bring in and, and he's from London and uh, he was a terrific shot blocker in Juco, uh, a college of Southern Idaho where he was last year. They were number one for a lot of the a lot of the year. And uh, same with uh, Cam Malray. He was on a ranked team at, at, at Dodge in, in Kansas last year. Logan McLaughlin, unfortunately, goes down with an injury. I, I know you guys were really looking forward to, to adding his perimeter shooting, but um, yeah. you yourself, I mean, you have Juco roots. So uh, how much has, has your philosophy on maybe recruiting changed a little bit? Because I know you guys have tried the portal and you do have some portal guys from this past yeah. off season, but you know, something tells me that, you know, you, you guys are kind of trending in a direction where you're going to maybe land some higher level high school kids because high school kids are getting recruited less and then obviously taking advantage of, of, of the Juco stuff. So compared to, like you said, your first day, your first off season, how much has, has that changed for you and, and what type of character guys you look for and what type of guys you try and use as building blocks for this program? Yes, yeah, it's, it's changed dramatically. The game, the NCAA college game has changed since I've been here. So, you know, from a recruiting standpoint with the transfer portal, with the COVID years and all that, um, yeah, when I first came here, I wanted to try and find, you know, um, some good high school guys and, and develop them and, 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 and just go that route. But, but now, yes, I'm more so into probably bringing in a lot of Juco guys and then finding a high school guy or two that's better than this conference. And fortunately for us, I think we have one coming that I can't speak on until he signs, but, um, but yeah, um, being a Juco coach myself, I always knew, like when I would, my sophomores, when they were ready to go division one, you know, they had learned how to compete and how to win and how to be successful on the basketball floor. And then they're gone. Right. And, and I gave them to a, a, a program that, you know, loved having that, that type of experienced guy in. And now I'm sitting in that seat saying, I need those guys. And so that's, that's shifted from my first year. And yeah, we're going to continue to uh, recruit the JUCO level because of that. Um, and and we're fortunate to get some good ones this past year. Paul Busyman, another portal guy that you bring in from uh, Eastern Illinois, who's had some good outputs uh, early in his Division I career. A couple freshmen, and and we're going to see him here off the jump. I'm talking about Quentin Jones. I'm talking about Justin Page, a couple guys that you inked out of the Midwest. Are, are you opening up some sort of Midwest to, to the Central Coast pipeline? Because uh, these are two guys that were heavily recruited by some some bigger programs, but you were able to get them 
to San Luis Obispo. Yeah, you know, every every coaching staff kind of like assembles their staff with 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 guys that have a, a geographical base area that they recruit from that that you may not, you know, and and I have some Midwest um, ties, but not as much as um you know uh, uh, Omar Lowry um, and Omar has has you know brought in some Midwest guys and and he I flew out there with him and and when I saw Quentin Jones and and Justin Page play. I said right away, we got to get those guys because, you know, if they were high school guys on the West Coast, they would probably be in the WCC or above, you know, and and so we're fortunate to have them. And I think, you know, they they have a great chance to to carve out a good career here. Um, uh, you know, so we're looking forward to continue that that trend of of, of recruiting some Midwest guys, but we still got to uh, recruit our roots in Southern California um, and, and Northern California, California in general. So yeah, it's it's looking forward to to just seeing it um, grow into fruition uh, with with these new guys. I've been hearing a lot of good things about um, Aaron Price uh, out of you know some of these inner squads and, and scrimmages. Only appeared in three games last year. Kind of kind of battled through some injuries, but I remember when you you went to Vegas to get this guy and. You know, he was playing the cello. He was getting straight A's, uh, and and he was really developing as a basketball player. I think he's he's kind of got a unique story to where you know COVID kind of kept him on the sidelines for a little bit, and and so he yeah. he's a little bit of a late bloomer. But um, with with everything I've seen, kind of going to a couple practices, I, it seems like he's already you know as an underclassman kind of taking a role as like a vocal leader for you guys. And I know you've been impressed with uh, what he's done on the floor. Tell tell me a little bit about you know what Cal Poly fans can expect from him because we didn't we didn't really see him a lot last year, right right and and to your point like COVID uh, kind of robbed him of his high school years and his high school development and but I saw the talent and the character and the energy um, right away and I knew he would be someone that we can we can develop into uh, a formidable um, foreman in this in this conference and. And he's he's developing that quicker than I thought. You know, I think last year sitting out was a, was a benefit for him. Um, he was able to sit back and and see what it looks like from the bench area. And now that he's on the floor, uh, you know, he's he's taking that experience and and he's talking through things. He's seeing things happen two and three steps ahead of time. You know, so and he's always been a vocal leader. He's a ton of energy. And he's one of the most athletic guys that I've ever been around. Like uh, last night, we had our Halloween hoops madness, and and um, we had a dunk contest. And and without even warming up, you know, he gets out there and does a windmill dunk, and 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 just shuts it down, and, and the whole dunk contest was over. But you know, he's a he's a he's a high IQ, not only high IQ um, off the floor, but on the floor as well. You know, he picks up things quickly. Um, so we're looking forward to you know, his his energy and his presence on the floor uh, more so this year. And, and keeping it in the post, you scroll down that roster, you're going to see a familiar name. Uh, maybe classify as a newcomer because he wasn't on the team last year. But, um, I mean, man, I, I didn't know we'd still have Calero guys in your fifth year. But, <laughs> hey, and I'll tell you this, man, Tuka Yakala, uh, you know, one, one of my favorite – one of my favorite plays to call are, are Tuka dunks because we could call him the flying fin, right? I mean, you yeah. could do a lot of a lot of stuff stuff like that. But um, how how did that come together, man? Because you know, th th I saw this guy at a couple games sitting courtside last year, kind of supporting you guys. And one time after a game or at halftime, he came up and tapped me on the shoulder, and he's like, "You know, I still got another year of eligibility." I thought he was just messing with me, but um, I saw him back at practice. He's back on the roster. Uh, Tell me how how this all came together because uh, he he is going to play for you guys this year. Yeah, yeah, he is. You know, um, you know, at the end of the year, Brian Penn Johnson had to have uh, career ending back surgery, um, and so we were without uh, a, a second post. And Tuka just happened to walk in my office right when I got that news, and and he and I had been joking about it, just like he joked about it with you. And I was like, uh, Tuka, you know we got an opportunity if, if, if it's here for you and, and, and if you want it, and he surely jumped on it. Um, you know, Tuca, as you remember my, my first year as a sophomore, he, he, we went to Iowa. He had 18 on Luca Garza. You know, he's one of the most skilled post guys with, you know, touch with his right and left hand and, and he plays hard and he's so smart and articulate, you know, so it just, 
it's something that Joel Armentrade needed because Joel's only been playing basketball for five years. So he's learning from Tuca, who, as you know, has played professionally with his country ever since he was 16 years old. So um, it's it's just a perfect mix and a perfect blend at the right time. And, and you know, God knows what he's doing when, when those things happen. <laughs> John Smith is our guest here on the Mustang Insider. Uh, right around the corner from the start of the college basketball season, you've got a, an exhibition that uh, opened to the fans inside Mott Athletic Center on Thursday, uh, our, our yearly game, it seems, against Cal State LA. And then uh, Laverne comes to town on Monday. I, I got to ask why why Bethesda's not on there. I feel like they've been the popular non-D1 of late. But um, I, I you kind of look at this schedule, and I, I know you guys had a little bit more home games on the front end last season, and, and that certainly helps. But uh, you, you go play some games at Elevation first week, uh, Thursday at Denver out of the Summit League, and then uh, a bye game at Wyoming on Saturday. And then you're down at, at Cal Baptist. Uh, St. Thomas is a really good program. Portland mm -hmm. State, we've seen them the last two years. I know they're going to be eager for some revenge. And then and the Cal Baptist team that you're seeing for a third straight year. And then you get a nice home game end of the month against Tim Miles and San Jose State. And then you're back on the road. Idaho, that new arena. Oregon State, early December. Weber State, the big sky favorite before you wrap it up with a couple home games here against Eastern and uh, Omaha. T take me through this this non-conference schedule, kind of your your outlook on it, your your expectations, and and what the hope is to, to get accomplished in terms of getting better with this group between November 6th and the conference opener here against CSUN December 28th. Yeah, you will see this team uh, progressively get better um, month to month because there's so many new guys. But, you know, we were trying to put together a schedule that 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 uh, mimicked um, pretty much what we're going to see in conference. And like you said, Denver and, and St. Thomas and those guys are are teams that I feel can, could, you know, compete at the high level in our conference. Um, uh, so we were just trying to challenge ourselves and, and try and find someone uh, because we we ha didn't have a lot of home games this year to find similar opponents that we can really compete with and, and learn from and, and, and put ourselves in adverse situations, you know, and, and learn from it. Um, it's about learning, you know, every, every month and every game. And, and this schedule is done. will do that for us. So I'm looking forward to it. Um, there's some challenging games, but there's some games that, that I feel that, you know, if, if we come together and, and we do the things that we're consistently trying to do, that we'll have a great chance to pull out a dub at the end. Uh, Big West in the off season, and and again, I mean, I, I had Chanel Styers on the show last week. We we talked about how, uh, as a college basketball fan, you get so invested from November to March, and then with the transfer portal, it's almost like free agency now, right? Where yeah. you're, you're just kind of hanging around, and and you're, you're kind of waiting to see who leaves and who stays, and what guys you're going to be able to get out of the portal as you complete your roster. And then you're kind of in a, stand, a standstill, right? From like June, July, August, you, you've got your roster assembled. You've got your guys. You're just kind of waiting to ramp it up to get into practice, to to get closer to those exhibition and those scrimmage dates. But the Big West in the offseason, they they skinnied the field a little bit. So, you know, you guys as a 10 seed last year, knocking off Long Beach State, which I don't know if it's the best thing for, for everybody involved. But, I mean, twice – uh, in, in the last three years, you guys as the 10 seed have, have won an opening round Big West game. Now there's a little more incentive to the regular season now to finish in the top eight. It's kind of going back to that old format that that they had back in your first season. And of course, back in your six years as the associate at Cal State Fullerton. Want to get your thoughts on that and just kind of your thoughts uh, on the conference as a whole. I mean, uh, I know you don't pay too much attention to the, the the preseason polls and stuff like that. Those are those are all but meaningless. But what are your thoughts on the the Big West this year? What to expect? Kind of more of the same. I mean, I know that team about an hour and a half south of us is getting a lot of preseason buzz. Uh, they, they won it last year. They they reloaded in the portal again this year. What are your thoughts on the conference as you kind of look ahead? Well, the conference is the conference. It always is going to be the same way, I feel, as long as there's not a lot of coaching changes. There's some unbelievable coaches in this conference uh, that that know how to coach and know how to prepare. So there's going to be a lot of parity, as as usual, within this conference. Um, I don't, like you said, I don't pay attention to the the, the rankings or or, you know, what players other people have brought in, because when it comes down to it, we know each other like the back of each other's hand. We know how to prepare for each other. So there will be uh, a lot of parity. It just depends on who stays healthy, who stays out of foul trouble um, to, to show um, who's going to rise to the top and who can, who can uh, you know, fight through adverse situations. So 
Uh, that's why we pretty much scheduled our preseason conference the way we did to try and get our guys used to some adversity um, because it's going to happen in conference. But, um, you know, with the eight, the eight teams going to the tournament, you know, it's unfortunate that not every student athlete will get a chance to, to experience the tournament. And that was some of the things that we talked about as a, as a conference, as head coaches, like we think every player should experience the tournament, but you know, for, <laughs> for us, it's just extra motivation to not be, you know, to, to, to make sure that we're in that top, top four. That's, that's what we're always trying to strive for is to be in the top four. And every year, whether we were the 10th seed the last two out of three years, we were still trying to be in that top four and, and, and nothing has changed. So, you know, the, the goal is the goal, the standard is the standard, and we're trying to meet it every single year. And then perhaps the most ludicrous thing of this entire off season came out last week and just about every non power five commissioners come out with a statement about it, but the NIT is no longer going to take the regular season champ. And you almost wonder, um, and, and look, I'm a big fan of conference tournaments. Uh, Cal Poly, you have to be because you, you, you did it as the seventh seed. And we saw you at Fullerton um, do it as a non one seed, right? I think you guys were a four seed, right? When you went in, in 18 or five seed, some, something like that. So, yeah. So the NIT is not taking the Big West regular season champ anymore. They're not taking the, the Summit regular season champ. They're not taking the WAC, Big Sky, so on and so forth. Uh, it, it's too bad because you go down to – now, Cal Poly's never been in the NIT, but you go down to, like, Long Beach State. They've got a banner, and they've got their NIT years up there. Cal State Bakersfield, before they joined the conference, they are in the Final Four of the NIT. They got to go to Madison Square Garden in, in 2018. Um, Irvine's been there. Uh, Davis has been there in recent memory. I mean, what, what, why? I mean, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, it just doesn't make, obviously it's, it's all right. We all bend the knee to the, the almighty dollar, right? We've seen that with conference realignment, TV deals, obviously, you know, big West doesn't have the sexy names, but you know, wouldn't you rather, um, you know, say a, a big West team that wins 22 regular season games slips up in the conference tournament. Obviously this isn't a two bid league. It hasn't been for a while, probably won't be again for quite a while. But wouldn't you rather have that than like a like a fourteen win Big Ten team get into the NIT? We, we've seen. I mean, North Texas won the NIT last year. Right. FAU was in the Final Four. San Diego State was was in the national title game. What are we doing in college basketball? And and is there any way at this point to change the NCAA's mind about the direction that things are going? The only way we could change the NCAA's mind about the direction is if we get people the people that are making the decisions come from seats like this you know um that have been there and done that and as a coach and there's plenty of people out there that have retired that can easily be on a committee to help with these type of decisions because what they don't understand is like when you remember this we went to the ncaa tournament at cal state fullerton and the following year we're in the big west championship game and we end up losing to irvine and irvine goes well we got selected to go to a postseason tournament and our guys didn't want to go, right? It's going to be the same thing with the Power 5 schools. They think, oh, for the TV ratings, we need to have the Power 5 schools in the NIT. Well, they don't want to play that. They don't want to play in that. And you're still not going to get ratings, good ratings or anything because it's going to be bad basketball. It's going to be bad basketball. So the the, the people that are making this decision have never sat in the seat and never had you know, uh, a, a chance to see the excitement of a, 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 a mid-major team go to the NIT and still play with that type of energy and that fire that that March provides, that March Madness provides. So it's unfortunate that money is driving it, but hopefully we'll get back to some sanity and get get some the right people in there making the right decisions. Yeah, we, and we don't need a 90-team NCAA tournament. I mean, no. what, are we, what are we rewarding here? You know, um, Cal State LA, the the Golden Eagles come to town Thursday, seven o'clock. You can listen on ESPN, the ticket, or uh, get out to Mata Athletic Center, support the Mustangs. The real thing, Monday, seven p.m. The Laverne Leopards come to town uh, up from Southern California before the Mustangs uh, hit the road for the next five. Coach, appreciate your time. Really excited for the upcoming season, and uh, look forward to more conversations like this soon. Same here. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate you. This has been the Mustang Insider Show. The preceding has been a Learfield's presentation on the Cal Poly Sports Network.